So the, uh, the title of what we're doing today is why read Jonathan Edwards and what he has to say about secularization. And there's been some debate as to whether you put the Z there or not, but it, it's there at the moment at least. So uh, Edwards has been someone that I've looked at for many years and there's a whole story as to why I ended up looking at him that we can get into if you like. Um, but my particular approach to Edwards has always been his response to the enlightenment. The enlightenment was uh, the 18th century movement of uh, new science and in light, in new light, uh, they called them, they called what was going on, the sense of a whole light, new learning, new science. And it increasingly moved uh, into a, what we would call secularizing or even atheistic um, direction uh, through the influence of the French philosophes. And when I was at Cambridge, um, my background was history, but I ended up particularly studying philosophical history and particularly the Enlightenment um, and particularly the French um, philosophes. And as I was studying them, I was looking for a figure to help me be a um, parallel conversation partner. And I stumbled on Edwards uh, providentially in the University Library at Cambridge. And um, since then, he's been a really good sparring partner for me to try to figure out how we can best respond to um, not only enlightenment or modernistic thinking but postmodernistic thinking or whatever stage of development we've got to right now but the whole sort of secularization agenda uh, so that's what we're looking at today this is me you've already heard about this okay so who was Jonathan Edwards let me just give us some basic stuff so we'll just level set before we get into some more of the how Edwards helps us with um, responding to um, post-modernity, modern ways of thinking, enlightenment thinking, secularization. So um, he's an 18th century figure, 1703 to 1758. Actually, Edwards died, and this is kind of um, uh, interesting right now. He died from an inoculation uh, for smallpox. So Edwards was very much into science throughout his life. And when he, at the end of his life, became president of what is now known as Princeton College um, in New Jersey, in America, he, uh, there was a smallpox um, breakout and he believed in inoculations and the science behind them. And so he uh, took it on himself to set an example by having a smallpox inoculation, and, but he actually died from it. So that's how it was died in 1758 anyway, and he's buried in Princeton. And there's a wonderful um, description of Edwards's influence at uh, the at his uh, graveside in Princeton, which if you ever get to America is well worth a visit. Anyway, he was a, uh, who was he? He was a local church pastor um, in a then famous pulpit in Northampton, Massachusetts. He took over from his grandfather, Solomon Stoddard. Solomon Stoddard was a famous pastor in his own right had led many what were called um, harvests or what we might call revivals today um, and was something of a controversial figure in his own right at the time. And Edwards was hired as his associate and then when Stoddard died became uh, the pastor of the church. Um, Edwards was also preternaturally bright. So he uh, went to Yale at a very, very young age, Yale, what became Yale University, um, got fascinated by John Locke. Um, he's something of, the, of a sort of Mozart of theology, just a child protege, almost a child protege intellectually. But uh, he was called to, to be a preacher and a pastor and his, his father, uh, Timothy Edwards had trained him and anyway, he became a pastor in a famous pulpit at the time in Northampton. He was at the heart of something called the Great Awakening. So you think of John Wesley, George Whitfield. Um, Edwards helped Whitfield in his first tour of America, um, what was of course then colonial America. Um, and Edwards had some early revivals before the Great Awakening in his own church and published um, a description of them called a faithful narrative of surprising conversions, which was very influential. Lots of young people were converted and um, he was right at the heart of the great awakening. And he became a theologian of revival. Um, 
and he wrote a number of different works on this, as I say, the faithful narrative, surprising conversions, but also uh, distinguishing marks, uh, later the religious affections, one of his most famous works. And um, he defended the revival. So the revival became quite controversial. Um, the conservatives, um, ministers like Chauncey from Boston, who was a, was a um, very intellectual, uh, culturally conservative uh, leader at the time, uh, attacked the revival for um, leading to <laughs> too much emotion and defended it uh, 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 and defended a more rationalistic approach uh, to Christianity. Um, and then on the other side of the debate, there were extremists who just wanted more and more emotion. And Ed, Edwards had positioned himself as uh, what historians call a moderate new light. So there were the old lights who were against the revival, the new lights who were for the revival, but became increasingly strange and extremist. Um, one famous case was even a public burning of books and this sort of thing. They became more and more um, radical. Uh, but Edwards defended the revival, but in a moderate new light way, and he published a lot on it. Um, theologically, he was reformed. Uh, he was a Puritan congregationalist, though he actually, in his private notebooks, there's one, uh, one of his writings on, I'm Baptistic, my background, I know this isn't a point of division among us, mercifully, and we have people who are infant Baptists in our church too, in leadership, we don't take that as a point of division and I grew up in the Church of England so I'm not I'm not trying to score points here I'm just it's just interesting when he was writing on infant baptism at the end there's a later so this is his private notebooks uh, at the end there's a later hand probably his could be his son we're not quite sure but it's slightly bigger writing um, which just says these things about baptism be doubtful which I think would be a good a good uh, summary statement to put on any on any book published on Baptist. <laughs> uh, but uh, he was Puritan congregationalist and actually his experience of congregational polity led him because he was ejected. He was thrown out of his pulpit, as we'll see uh, uh, as I go through the story a little bit. His experience of that led him to actually in some ways prefer Presbyterian polity. So anyway, but that was his background, reform Puritan congregationalist. Um, he would say he was Calvinist, uh, but for the sake of definition, that's his phrase, quote unquote. So he, he didn't, he wasn't really a system Calvinist, um, uh, but a biblical Calvinist, to use uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones' distinction. Uh, Lloyd-Jones was very influenced by Jonathan Edwards, of course. I can talk about that, as many other people have been. Um, but he he acknowledged, you know, Calvin has been influenced, but he would say for the sake of definition, and Edwards was very much his own thinker. And people who uh, described him contemporaries, so one of the things that made him stand out was how much he studied the Bible, used the Bible. Um, he was a Bible man, not a, not a system man, but, you know, for the sake of definition, that was his background. Uh, he was very creative. He had extensive private notebooks on various philosophical and theological questions. So there's one on the mind, there's one on science, um, there's um, uh, a whole lot of discussion on uh, what philosophers call immaterialism, like the real nature of matter. Um, and uh, so he was uh, he thought as he wrote, he would say. So that's why one of the reasons why we have so much material is when Edwards was thinking, he was always writing and he kept a very orderly set of notebooks to describe his writing and you can trace his development, but he was a very creative thinker. Um, he was a family man. So uh, he um, famously had a very loving relationship with Sarah, his wife. And um, there's a rather it's a romantic um, historical fiction, or at least historical elaboration book written about that called Married to a Difficult Man, which is about what it must have been like for Sarah to be married to Edwards. But um, at any rate, he, he had a very loving relationship with his wife and it was commented on the time. Um, and he was a very committed father of his 11 children. We've there's a lot of letters that we've got that he wrote to them clearly uh, devoted to his children. 
Um, and so we've got someone here who had a really good family life, as far as we can tell, um, not like um, some of the stories we have from Wesley and Whitfield, but a very committed family life. And now this is quite a claim, but I think it's defendable. I would say he's, if not the, certainly a, but the foremost Christian intellectual in American history. And I know we were joking about earlier whether he was American or he obviously from the colonial period, but uh, he obviously, his um, ancestors were uh, you know, fully a part of the American uh, context. And normally he's thought of in terms of that American context. And increasingly the whole culture became distinctly American. So, but he, he was brilliant. And I would say he was, he's the Augustine of uh, American theology. Um, so that's kind of commonly understood about Edwards. Um, but what is often not understood about Edwards? Um, here are some things. Edwards was formulating a proactive response to the movement known as the Enlightenment. So this is this was my area of research that I did at Cambridge and then at Yale. Yale is where um, Edwards's manuscripts are kept. And um, what we discovered is that he was very engaged with Enlightenment thinking. Um, he um, was engaged through um, his um, the books he read, of course, but also the journals he read, his correspondence. And um, my case has been over the last, gosh, 15, 20 years or so, that he was actually proactively responding to the Enlightenment and that we can learn from the way he did that as we try, try to proactively respond to our new um, postmodern situation. Um, what was the Enlightenment? The Enlightenment was a movement of the new science. So think of obviously Isaac Newton, um, uh, but uh, also um, the philosophical thinking behind that, John Locke, uh, most famously, but then it increasingly moved towards a sort of anti-clerical and then for the anti-Christian Enlightenment with people like Rousseau and D'Alembert, and um, uh, all, all that um, uh, Europe, European Enlightenment as well, as well in Italy as well, uh, Giambattisti Vico, uh, the new science, um, all this movement of a sort of in an anti-clerical, anti-Christian in, in, uh, in way. Um, but then also people like Hobbes, um, who was uh, not overtly anti-Christian, but clearly that was the direction of his movement and was very sort of fatalistic in his approach. And Edwards engaged in all this kind of stuff. Um, what was his response? Um, primarily around the issue of what I call spiritual epistemology. So epistemology just means how we uh, know or the study of how we know things. And uh, the case I've made is that Edwards uh, was formulating spiritual epistemology around the gospel from the Bible on how you can know the presence of God in this new enlightenment environment where obviously there was a more um, mechanistic view of the world with uh, Newtonian physics. And fascinating, a lot of what Edwards um, intuited is in many ways uh, more at home with a uh, Einsteinian or even quantum uh, way of looking at um, the physical sciences. And I'll, I'll mention that a little bit later. Um, and he, um, he worked out this epistemology in his private notebooks. Um, but then when you read his sermons, you don't see a whole bunch of technical jargon or complicated ideas. Actually, his sermons are crystal clear and very uh, simple language, uh, though deep ideas with simple language. Um, but that, that was the backdrop to his, um, uh, his preaching uh, with Revival Fire uh, to his uh, congregation. So what was Edwards arguing? What was his main case? I put it like this, uh, gospel light. So uh, think of the enlightenment, obviously using light as a analogy uh, here. And he was arguing for gospel light. So everyone around him is saying, we've got a new light. Uh, this is the new light. And he's saying, actually, what we need is a gospel light. So one of his most famous um, books um, uh, and uh, sermons, a divine 
and supernatural light um, being both a rational and spiritual doctrine. So what he's saying is the real light is from Christ and he's defending that both spiritually and rationally. So that's partly what he was arguing. Uh, he's also, and this is in the backdrop to it, and somewhat, I think, surprisingly, when you first think, okay, here's a Calvinist, going to be kind of traditionalistic. But actually, Edwards argued for a non-materialistic approach to the universe. So um, he argued that um, God was uh, constantly upholding uh, the world, but not only constantly upholding the world, which would be a sort of normal way of expressing some of the teachings, for instance, in the book of Hebrews or what uh, Paul describes when he preaches uh, in, uh, in Acts to, to Athens. Um, in him, we move and have our being. Um, but uh, not only upholding, but for Edwards, constantly recreating. So he would say that the evidence we have for God's existence, because of this idea he had in his mind of constant recreation, the evidence we have for God's existence is as strong as we would have had at the moment of creation uh, we have now, because God is constantly recreating the universe. It's an unusual way of putting it, but behind that is this very strong, non-materialistic approach to stuff, to matter. So he would say, uh, philosophically or strictly speaking, the only substance, and he's using that, that word in an Aristotelian sense, the only substance is God. God is the only substance. And everything else is a, is a uh, projection out of God's mind through his word into existence. And obviously that attitude then changes how you approach um, um, interacting with the new science. Uh, and this is the part, of course, in some ways is more, you know, when you talk about some of the new ideas of physics and cosmology, like string theory and quantum and all this sort of thing, um, is actually uh, jives with it better than it even did during Newtonian times, or purely Newtonian times, obviously we haven't rejected that entirely. Um, and then the communication of the presence of God. So God is constantly present um, in response to the enlightenment is the sort of central bit. Now that all sounds kind of heavy and you think, okay, I'm, you know, maybe I'm a, a pastor, I'm preaching to a congregation. It sounds very cerebral, uh, but actually it's, it was directed at a very practical contemporary need. It also sounds like, okay, so I live in, you know, uh, Europe and a whole bunch of non-Christians around me. We're talking about Puritan New England where everyone was a Christian. How relevant can it be? Um, but actually it's helpful to know some of the context. Um, the society at the time uh, around him was not only intellectually imbibing new light, um, there was also a lot of, quite a lot of evidence of practical moral lucis. So for instance, Harvard, um, there's a lot of description of the time of the kind of moral laxity that we, that we wouldn't be surprised to read about in contemporary descriptions of what's going on in the universities. Um, and you can see the same with Whitfield. You think, okay, so they would have all been strict conservative, you know, all born again, that sort of thing. Actually, well, no, uh, Whitfield, and Whitfield got into trouble for this, but he went around uh, declaring that various preachers were not actually born again. And that was certainly not a, a way to win friends and influence people and was not a very um, savvy approach. Um, but the reason why he was doing it is because almost certainly there was um, unconverted preachers around. Um, and then the, um, uh, the, the, the New England Puritan thing was breaking down or had broken down, uh, less, co less conversions, um, all that sort of thing. And so there's a, there's a, in Edward's day, there's a great need for an awakening. So it's not, it seems like oh, it must be such a different context. It's not as different a context, spiritually speaking, as you might immediately think. Um, so just a little bit about Edwards at a personal spiritual level. Um, uh, one, and this is something you could, you know, if you want to read up about Edwards later, I, I recommend this would be one place to start would be his personal narrative. 
um, and or you can read about his um, his resolutions. Um, but when you read it in his in his personal narrative, you get a real sense of his spiritual um, vitality and commitment. Same with his resolutions. Um, uh, for instance, his uh, one little entry from uh, the Sabbath, January the 6th, 1722. And he's writing it at night. So, you know, he was um, not very, not very old at this time, just 19 or so. And uh, he says, much concerned about the improvement of precious time as a theme for Edwards. He was a miser with his time. I mean, he was very, very concerned to use every moment for God's glory. Uh, he writes, intend to live in continual mortification without ceasing. And of course, that word mortification has a Puritan heritage. It, it means um, putting to death uh, sin. And even to weary myself thereby, as long as I am in this world, um, <laughs> he says, and never to expect or desire any worldly ease or pleasure. I mean, this guy was uh, unusually intense, let's put it like that. And one of the things he comes across as you read about his conversion is there's a moment when what had before been hateful for him, God's sovereignty, now became sweet to him. And that's a classic Edwards phrase, that idea of the sweetness of God. And uh, the sovereignty of God then influenced a lot of what he preached and taught. Um, he engaged with the Enlightenment through, um, I, I've mentioned this through the reading of learned journals. Here's some of the people he engaged with, Locke, Newton, Hobbes, uh, the Cambridge Platonists, who were a, a school of, uh, I suppose you could say, latitude, latitudinarian theologians, kind of, kind of like drifting. Uh, the deists, who uh, deism is a, a teaching that God is distant, uh, sets the world in motion, not directly involved. Um, and Edwards is very much dealing with deism at the time and any kind of and all this exposure to enlightenment thinking. He did this through reading learning journals, mm -hmm. and you can find it in his mis miscellanies and uh, private notebooks. And um here are some of the key elements of his message as preached and, and published um and these would be uh i would say you know if you want to read a few sermons of his these would be good places to start uh the first god glorified in man's dependence it was a sermon preached to a group of boston clergy by invitation when Edwards was really um, still quite young, he just started at his pulpit um, in Northampton. And he preached, uh, it's called God Glorified in Man's Dependence, on Paul's um, uh, uh, teaching in 1 Corinthians 1, 29 to 31, uh, that, that, that the gospel is designed so that no one would boast. And when you read God Glorified in Man's Dependence, you get... Edwards is setting out his stall. He's putting out his basic framework of his teaching. And that's a, a great place to start. Um, and then this divine and supernatural light immediately imparted is both a rational and spiritual doctrine. You get a sense of how he's engaging with um, the enlightenment through biblical thinking. Obviously, a divine and supernatural light is about regeneration, uh, but he's using language that engages um, with the enlightenment. And justification by faith alone, should, it should be here, justification by faith alone, uh, is a published treatise, um, uh, was a, a lecture that was then expanded uh, for publication, had a huge impact at the time in uh, some of the early awakenings. And it's, if you're a theologian who's dealing with, for instance, some, maybe some of the new perspective on Paul or things like that, read this work. You'll be amazed at how relevant it is and how 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 some of the issues that are sort of presented as new and no one's thought about this before. You go back and read Justification by Faith Alone and Edwards is addressing a lot of these um, same issues about the law and uh, union and, 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 and all the rest in that, in that work. Um, 
he was a theologian of revival, and you'll find his theology of revival uh, here. Uh, narrative surprising versions, the distinction marks the work of God, religious affections. He was not old light, Chauncey, nor radical new light tenant, but moderate new light. And this is a, a good um, uh, framework handle for us to deal with new movements that Edwards was trying to find, like there is, there is a work of God here. This is superficial and is unhelpful, um, but here's the work of God that needs to be protected. And one of his principles here is that the uh, the um, uh, there are there are things that are not signs, and there are things that are signs, and a lot of in his view, uh, both on the left, um, the, the radical new light tenant, and on the extreme right, Chauncey, the old light, were fixated about the things that are not signs, that are insignificant, um, bodily impact, like shaking. Um, the superficial stuff, you know, where the idea came from originally, all those things he would say are, are, are not significant because they are expressions of our humanity. We are physical. We will have physical responses to deeply emotional things and, emo and engaging with God is going to be deeply emotional because that's how we're made. Instead, he, fi he, fi he focused on what, what are biblical signs and most prominently the and he lists several of them, but most prominently is what he calls humble love. And he, he describes it because love biblically is the greatest uh, and, and the harmony of all the fruit of the spirit. Um, but he described that as humble love to distinguish between sometimes the prideful way we can position ourselves as very loving. And anyway, it's a, a, a brilliant when I'm training pastors, one of the things I say is you should read religious affections because it will it will give you a, a toolbox to deal with with any number of different um, movements or new ideas or experiences that you come across. Um, uh, a good relationship with George Whitfield. Whitfield was a different kind of preacher to Edwards, much more dramatic. And uh, you know, Edwards uh, Whitfield when he preached um, on David would 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 kind of dramatize David, um, very different kind of preacher, uh, but uh, Edwards had a high regard for Whitfield. He preached in Edwards' church, he wept while Whitfield preached. Um, and the other thing, if you want to understand his theology of revival is to read a book called The History of the Work of Redemption. You think, well, that, what's that got to do with revival? Well, the point here is that Edwards is making the case in this, in this book that revivals, are the main engine of God's uh, God growing the kingdom. And he makes this case across the history of the church. And of course, if that's the case, then um, we're longing for revival, seeking to promote revival. And, um, and there's a whole, we can talk about this afterwards, but there's a whole important balance that I think Edwards helps us with in terms of what revival is, what it isn't, how we can promote it without it becoming manipulative. Uh, how we can have a theology of revival without that becoming passive in terms of our engagement with practical evangelism and all the rest. But there's where you can read up some more about it and happy to answer any questions about it. Um, probably if you have heard of Edwards before, the one thing you, you may have heard of him is his most famous sermon, um, which is called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And people who've only heard of that sermon tend to think of Edwards as just a hellfire preacher. Um, but it's really important to understand that in context. I wrote um, an article uh, for this uh, for Crossway a few years ago. You can Google it, find it, and I describe this a little bit more. But um, the point is that, um, first of all, sinners in the hands of angry God, uh, it's not at the time unusual uh, for a preacher to preach on hell. So for us, you know, if we turned up to church one Sunday morning and the uh, preacher preached only on hell and warning people the danger of hell. That would be a surprise. I mean, even if we go to conservative evangelical churches and we would expect sometimes to hear about hell, we would not expect a whole sermon about nothing else. Um, but in a New England Puritan context, preaching on hell was not unusual. So um, in context, the thing that would have surprised people was not that he was preaching on hell. 
would not be surprising at all. Um, what what surprised people was the um, the effects of this particular sermon. The other thing to understand about this is, is that the dramatic descriptions we have of the impact of this sermon, um, people clinging to the pillars for fear of falling into hell, that sort of thing, and a huge revival um, being further stoked because of the sermon. Uh, those dramatic descriptions come not the first time uh, the sermon was preached. So he'd actually preached it before, and we have no real description of any kind of impact of any extraordinary kind the first time he preached it which is fascinating and i think quite encouraging as a preacher because you know really the the impact of sermon is in the hands of our god isn't it and his anointing and his power but he preached it to his congregation and seemed to have gone okay and he obviously liked it he had sermons that um the man who trained me would call good travelers so you know this was a sermon he knew was a win so it was a good sermon and he was going to preach it again and he made a note that he preached it once and he was going to preach it again but when he went to preach it, he preached it to a congregation that had been resistant to the revival so far. So if you kind of drew a map, you would have um, this, um, uh, this congregation and around it would be fires of revival, but there'd be not much happening in this place. Edwards, we also think this is the tradition. We're not 100% sure, but the tradition is that Edwards actually wasn't the first invited preacher uh, for that event, which is also encouraging if you're a, a preacher. You think, well, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't, I, I only got asked because I was, the other guy said no. Well, one of the most famous sermons in church history, you know, only got preached because the other guy said no or couldn't make it, what, you know. So uh, Edwards wasn't the first in, invited preacher. Um, and what happened was he began to preach. And it was um, at the time, the revival preachers would travel around in teams and minister together. So Edwards was preaching, and then afterwards there'd be a time of people to, to talk to and pray for and, and lead people to Jesus and help them spiritually among a, a team of ministers. And Edwards was preaching, and the response was so electric that he couldn't he could never he couldn't even finish the sermon. He had to break off before the end. And then him and the other ministers uh, went down to the people and started praying for them. So I think all that gives quite a different context. And when you actually read the sermon, um, the other thing to notice is that basically the message of the sermon is, uh, if God was not merciful, um, then there's no um, natural reason why we would not immediately fall into hell. If God was not merciful, and so it's really dependent upon the mercy and grace of God and I call someone to, to call out to God for that, for that grace and mercy. So I just think it's important. If you have heard of Edwards, you've probably heard of that sermon. It's important to put it in context. Um, and of course he preached many other sermons. I mean, you know, hundreds of thousands of things. And there are others that have a very different, perhaps less well remembered outside of Edwards scholarship, but at the time were, if anything, more influential. Um, there's one very famous series of sermons all about love called Charity and Its Fruits, which is just brilliant. Um, and there's a famous uh, sermon called A Burning and Shining Light, which is Edwards preaching at the ordination of another pastor. And he uses um, uh, John the Baptist as an uh, analogy for what the ideal uh, preacher should be that is a burning and shining light so in other words the ideal preacher should both have um, spiritual fire burning passion but also shining there should be clarity and logic and that's that's a good way of describing uh, Ebers's ministry and of course the ideal of any uh, word ministry to be both that have that spiritual fire but also that logical word clarity to a burning and shining light. Um, what about Edwards's um, life and ministry? Uh, was it, uh, I see we're at 8, uh, 8.40, uh, uh, so I'm going a bit long. Uh, uh, do I have just like a couple more minutes and I can be done? Does that sound good? Okay, yeah. Um, uh, he, so he's known for studying um, 13 or 14 hours a day in his study. Is that really exemplary? Um, he certainly had a good relationship with his family. He did no pastoral visitation, 
he interviewed in his study. Is that really exemplary or is that just specific to him? That's a good question. He was very active in training younger pastors. They would stay with him and he had a list of theological questions that he would grill them on. Um, so that's, that's good. But I think we have to, like there's some bits that are worth modeling your life on from Edwards and other bits perhaps you don't. Um, there were some controversies. You can ask me about them. Uh, the bad book case, um, the communion controversy. He had enemies who followed him after he'd thrown out of his pulpit all the way to Stockbridge and kept on harassing him really the rest of his life. Um, and slavery. Edwards did own slaves. Um, we know of three, one of whom was called Venus. And Edwards actually uh, spoke in defense of slavery, which is an extraordinary thing to find but against slave um, trading. And Edwards's argument is basically, this is a reality of the society we're in. We can't change it. We need to do it the best we can. Um, so it's not like he was in defense of it. He was saying, it's a reality we have to adjust to. So what do we learn? Here are some thoughts. Establish clearly in your mind the pivotal issues, not merely the superficial moral causes. And that takes just time in prayer with the Bible. What's really going on? So we, it's easy just to look at the superficial moral causes, but what are the pivotal issues? Um, construct a clear articulation of biblical messages in the language of our own day. So for him, he used this light, and indeed sense of the heart was another one he used. I can explain more about that if you like. Be unembarrassed in our commitment to reading and preaching the Bible. So he was creative, but his creativity came from a submission to Scripture. Now that idea is counterintuitive for many people, but it's core to what made Edwards brilliant is that he submitted his mind to the Word, and because he did that, uh, he was given huge insight. Um, his uh, claim, the core issue we're facing is epistemolog epistemological. How can we really know God? And uh, that's been a lot of the message of the last decade or so of my life, that the answer is calling people to a God-centered life. Um, any mistakes to avoid from Edwards? Um, well, obviously the slavery thing uh, we wish he had in, articulated a clear antipathy to mo those that moral issue, even if, if, if he realized he couldn't change it himself. So there may be moral issues today that we think, I can't do anything about that, but we still need to verbalize an antipathy to it prophetically. And I think the other thing to learn, mistake to avoid from Edwards, is to understand the importance of personal relationships in church and ministry leadership. Edwards uh, did have friends. He had a very good great family, but he leant towards um, the intellectual response rather than the relational response. And I think his life would have been a lot easier if he'd, if he'd uh, been better at um, uh, the relation, 